We remind you to silence your phone and turn on your key coil if you have one. If you are a first time visitor, please take a welcome bag from the table in back of the sanctuary. Also, remember to sign the friendship pad and pass it along. The announcements are listed in the bulletin, and I'm wondering if there are any other announcements today. If not, I'll turn it over to Karen Packard. I want to start out by saying something a little different this time. Last night I was thinking about this service and how special it is to all of us because it is the beginning of the church. And I became so excited I couldn't go to sleep. That's how excited I was. I think, gee, this is neat. Not only that, but we're celebrating something else. And before I go into the rest of my centering, it's 150 years for the UMW, and see those cupcakes? There are a lot of them, a bunch of them in there. So go on and have them afterwards. <laughs> long, long ago, Jesus appeared to his disciples many times to prove beyond a doubt that he was alive, and it, there was a great message about the kingdom of God, and it was going to be coming. And they were told to stay in Jerusalem and wait for the gift that the Holy Spirit would bring. Well, they stayed together. He, he rose on the 40th day. And on the 50th, wow, the winds blew and the disciples were going nuts. I guess that may not be a good term, but they thought they were drunk. And after that, they started speaking in many languages to the many people from different countries. And it was an exciting time because in their own language, they were told, you know, he died for you and you helped cause it. You caused it. Now, Jesus died for your sins. You have to accept them. And so that's what they did. The, he told the disciples in their own language, and they started sharing with other people, and they started sharing with other people, and the church was born. And it was a big church, bigger church than maybe if all of you went out and talked to 10 people, Wow! Anyhow, that is what this day is. It's a bigger day than Christmas, and you have a gift, and I'm going to tell you what it is at the end. But many people did believe, and this is what we call Pentecost. Now, that was a long time ago, before any of us were alive. And 150 years ago, there was another experience that we're going to share. And that is, we sent missionaries to other places. And you'll find out about them, but they told men all about, they, the men told all about Jesus when they went overseas. But a group of women realized that the women were not being cared for. They were neglected and they decided to start serving the women, and that became the Women's Missionary Group. The group in our church that reaches out to support missionaries is called the UMW. Now, let me tell you, we have certain groups here that support, that not everybody supports, but the women are called to support them. Now, as people, we are celebrating both Pentecost and the start of the UMW. In this vein, I want you to do something. I want you 
to sing happy birthday to the church in just a minute. Dottie will lead you. And then when you finish, I want you to immediately get out of those pews, greet others in the name of Jesus Christ, and share. And then when you get out of church, your gift is to share it with somebody else because there are many people that should be here. If you had a football game, you'd find more people there on that day than here. That's not good. That says where our love is, but we, they're important too, but we need to share our faith. And so let us sing happy birthday and at the end of it, after we finish, you are to get up and greet the others. I hate to stop all that lovely greeting. That was pretty fun. Thank you. So please uh, stand and join me in the call to worship. The spirit of truth is moving. The spirit of truth is speaking. The spirit of truth is with us. Please join me in singing hymn uh, 569 in the blue hymnals, and Dottie will lead us.
Thank you. You may be seated. Please join me in the opening prayer. Spirit of trust, pour out your presence on us. Cause wonders to occur as we dream our dreams and see your vision. Create unity and love as you weave us together as one body of Christ, one family of God, one community of justice and peace. Amen. Everyone who calls on the Lord of the name of God has been saved, is being saved, and will be saved. The scripture meeting, reading this morning is Acts 2, 1 through 3 from the New Living Translation. After Jesus ascended into heaven, his followers gathered together wondering what God had in store for them when suddenly the Holy Spirit came upon them. What happened next changed everything. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames and tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. The word of God for the people of God. And now we have a special gift of music from Laura and Alan Klein. Thank you so much, Laura and Alan. That was beautiful. Thank you for sharing your talent. So the scripture reading this morning is Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Jesus prepares his followers for what's coming next by giving them one last command before he ascends into heaven. <clears throat> Jesus came to and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even in the end of age. This is the gospel of the Lord. And do we have any young people in the congregation today? Okay, we have a uh, children's moment. Some people. Good. Thanks for coming up to talk to me today. Today we're celebrating two birthdays in the church. Two birthdays on the same day. One of the birthdays is the birthday of the church. We call it Pentecost. We don't know the exact day or even the exact year of the church's birthday, but the Bible tells a story about it. God told Jesus' disciples to go to other countries and teach people about God. But the disciples didn't speak the same language. Do you know Spanish? French? No. Latin? Egyptian? No? Okay. So how were the disciples going to teach other people if they, they couldn't communicate? They'd have to learn the language. Well, something magical happened on the birthday of the church. The Holy Spirit, right. The disciples were worried about this and suddenly it was like a big wind that came through and there were tongues of fire that appeared over the disciples' heads and suddenly they could speak other languages. It was amazing. So we remember that birthday by remembering fire, the flames, and you know, on our, our church, I notice up there, do you see the flame next to the cross? Uh huh. And red, wearing red, is a symbol of Pentecost, the church's birthday. Now, the other birthday that we're celebrating today is about a group of ladies 150 years ago that wanted to help teach about God. They wanted to go to other countries too, but only the men were allowed to teach. And some of the countries they went to, the men weren't allowed to teach the women. So that's not fair, is it? No, if, if the, the teachers go over and, and you're, a, you're a girl and you're a girl and they say, sorry, you're a girl, you can't, 
go to the classes because you're a woman. And so there were some ladies that decided they were going to do something about that, and they said, we're going to send some ladies over to help teach about God. So that's the other birthday we're celebrating today. Now, how do we celebrate birthdays? We did one thing already. We have cake or something. We sang, didn't we? We sang happy birthday. Uh huh. That's one thing. Is there anything else? You notice anything about the church today that has something to do with birthdays? Balloons, balloons right? We've got balloons. And I know if you look up here behind, do you see all those cupcakes on the table here? There are so many different kinds of cupcakes, and you can't have one right now. Sorry. But there are all of them you can have after church, okay? But I do have something that you can have to celebrate a birthday. Have you ever been to a birthday party when you have funny horns and things? And this is a tongue of fire. Okay? So I'm going to give you that. First, we're going to pray. Let's pray together, and you can repeat after what I say. Thank you, God, for birthdays. Thank you, Jesus, for teaching us. How to care for one another. Help us live in loving ways. Amen. Okay, now these are quiet ones. <laughs> and they're red. Okay. Is there somebody else you wanted to take one to? Do you want to take one to your brothers or anything? No. Okay. That's fine. That's fine. That's too bad. Thank you. And now we'll begin our message. My name is Clementina Rowe Butler. I was born in Ireland in 1820. My husband, William Butler, was also born in Ireland. He underwent a conversion experience there, joined the Wesleyan Church, and became a minister. I heard him preach in Ireland, and I was strongly influenced by the Wesleyan interpretation of Christianity. He immigrated to America in 1850 when I was 30 years old. He married and unfortunately was widowed twice in just three years. He wrote to me in Ireland, I made the journey across the ocean to the United States and we were married in 1854. I too was committed to the Wesleyan beliefs of doing all the good we can in all the places we can. In 1856, William and I set off to India as the Methodist Episcopal Church's first missionaries. It wasn't easy, but with God's help, we had accomplished great things. Excuse me, I lost my place. With God's help, we established a church, an orphanage, a school, and a printing press in India. In 1865, we returned to Boston. I was 45 years old. I was troubled because I could see so much need among the Indian women and children. In spite of all that we had accomplished, Indian customs limited the interaction of the women there with male doctors and teachers. I contacted my friend Lois Parker and we invited 28 Boston churches to a meeting on March 23, 1869. Maybe the weather was a factor, because it was a cold, stormy day, and the church doors were even locked when we got there, so there was some difficulty at the outset. Only eight women braved the elements to attend our first meeting. But we decided to go ahead and establish a society to raise funds and support a female missionary to India. I traveled to other Methodist Episcopal and Congregational churches, and very shortly we raised enough funds to send Isabella Thoburn, who was a teacher 20 years younger than me, and Dr. Clara Swain, a female doctor, to India. But there was more work to do. My husband was secretary of the American and Foreign Christian Union, and in 1873, we were sent to Mexico 
to do the same work that we had begun in India. We established churches, a girls' orphanage, schools, and a printing press. The printing presses were important to me as we published Christian literature for women in five different vernaculars. I have told my story to thousands of women, moving them to hope and action. Our Women's Foreign Missionary Society grew very quickly. My daughter became a missionary and continued our work in India. She wrote mission books for women. Our son was a missionary in Mexico for 44 years. When I was 90 years old, I was honored by the opening of the Mrs. William Butler Memorial Hospital in Baroda, India. I died three years later in September of 1913 at the age of 93. What a fulfilling life it was. Our Women's Foreign Missionary Society, which over the last 150 years has been called United Methodist Women, is now a worldwide organization. My name is Grace Stevens, and I was an Anglo-Indian missionary serving in Madras, India for the Women's Foreign Missionary Society, which was a predecessor organization of the United Methodist Women in the late 19th and early 20th century. I was a native of India and became a Methodist in 1874 after attending a revival held by Methodist missionary and evangelist William Taylor. After my conversion to Methodism, I first worked among English-speaking people, but eventually reached out to the Tamil-speaking population. I knocked on doors, collecting 17 pupils, and began teaching them English, Tamil, and sewing. Eventually, I was running a Methodist girls' orphanage and supervising nine day schools with nearly 600 pupils, a boarding school, and nine Sunday schools. In April 1886, I was appointed by the Women's Foreign Mission Society to be a Zanana worker. Zanana, meaning of the women, were the women's quarters in which upper caste Hindu women were secluded, segregated from men and persons of lower castes. These women were usually married off as children. Strict taboos ruled their lives. Eventually, I was supervising a visitation and educational ministry among 500 secluded upper caste women. I also edited Tamil language publications for women and girls. I believed in the power of the Christian faith to improve women's lives. I built trust with the women and stood up to many men in order to offer education and community, teaching the women English and Tamil and how to read and sew. And in doing so, I broke down gender barriers. Because I was teaching women and opening their worldview beyond their virtual enslavement in women's quarters, men fiercely opposed my work. They advised me to leave them alone and said that if the women cooked their food and kept to their homes, it was quite enough for them. Never shall I forget the words of late Judge Hun Swami as I stood in his grand house and pleaded with him to allow me to teach his ladies. To give the women education, he said, is like giving them liberty, and liberty to them is like giving wings to a bird. They lose themselves and want to fly away. Over the years, this relational form of mission broke down barriers between Hindus and Europeans, and the home lives of many secluded women were improved by creating more respect for women among Hindu men. However, if women became Christians, they were often thrown out of their homes. One Brahmin from an elite family, Subhanagam Amal, decided to follow Christ 
and she was declared dead by her family, who even held a funeral for her. Subu broke her caste to live equally with other Christians, partnered with me in visitation work, and taught low caste children. The example of Jesus Christ gave Subu the courage to break taboos and live in equality among people she had been raised to believe were inferior subhumans. In 1910, I attended the World Missionary Conference in Edinburgh, Scotland. I was the acknowledged supervisor of Methodist Zanana work throughout India. I was the only woman from Asia to attend and one of only 200 women. Reverend W. Raju in 1900 wrote about me, and I quote, she knows how to fight the good fight of faith and lead Christians into deeds of holy daring for Christ and his gospel. Her Christian life is full and complete because God governs her heart. I knew the Christian faith could transform women's lives, and I made it my life's work. I am Martha Drummer, an American, African-American born in 1871 in Barnesville, Georgia. I was the third of eight children. My father was a Methodist preacher and died of typhoid fever when I was 15 years old. My mother moved the family to Griffin, Georgia, where my siblings and I had access to public education. I finished sixth grade and then had to work as a domestic worker to help support the family. After a few years, my pastor recognized my scholarly potential and recommended me to the president of Clark College, an institution founded for African-American students by the Methodist Episcopal Church Freedmen's Aid Society. I was 22 at the time and needed com to complete prepar preparatory school to catch up on the secondary school I had missed. I then entered the college on partial scholarship and worked to provide for myself and the rest of the tuition. In the summers, I taught in rural schools and tutored Ameri African American children. It took me eight years to finish my preparatory and college degrees at Clark College, today known as Clark Atlanta University. I then went on to the Methodist Women's Training School for Deaconesses in Boston, Massachusetts. After two years there, I spent three more years to finish a nursing course. In 1906, I was hired by the Pacific Branch of the Women's Foreign Missionary Society as, a nur as the nurse deaconess. I was sent to serve at the Kwesa Mission in Melange, Angola. Bishop William Taylor was enlisting African American women to wor work with African women and children in several new stations in Africa, in Liberia, Angola, and the Congo. In Kwesa, I began work with Susan Collins, an African-American teacher sent from the Chicago area. I worked on the campus of Kwesa, but when the rains allowed, also went out into the villages on medical visits, often accompanied by Kwesa's Angolian Bible woman, Dorcas. I had a good reputation as a nurse, as shortly I, after I arrived in Kwesa, 38 children of the orphanage came down with fever and 37 of them survived. We only lost one. In addition to my Angolan patients, I also cared for other missionaries and, at times, for family members of the Portuguese colonizers. In addition to my nursing, I was also a preacher. When I arrived in the village, the chief would order beating drums so they might gather to hear me preach. I worked at Kwesa Mission for 20 years before returning to the U.S. in 1926 because of poor health. I never lost my love for my African home, and until my death in 1937, I continued to encourage Methodists to support the work there. I was described by my missionary coordinator, Lawrence Hopper, and I quote, Martha is irrepressible. Her spirit was not dampened, even by prolonged illness. The Kwesa Mission still exists today as Kwesa Mission Boarding School supported by the United Methodist General Board of Global Ministries. And now, as we are celebrating um, these two birthdays, we sang happy birthday to our church. I'd like everyone to stand, and we're going to sing happy birthday, UMW. 
I would like us to take just a moment to reflect on any joys or concerns you might have that have come upon this week or recently that you would care to share with the congregation, the good or the bad. We're all here in a supportive capacity. Are there any joys or concerns you would like to share? Yes. A new baby girl for Cole Henderson. That's awesome. Is there others? If I'm missing you. Yes. The joy of sunshine. That is a very good one, and I'm sure there are a lot of farmers and other people that are very appreciative of, of the sunshine. That's very yes, Twyla. Okay. Okay. The immigrants and, and things that are going on at our borders. I know we also have uh, our pastor and another, other congregation members that are at annual conference, we can lift them up in prayer. Any others? Well, if you would bow or pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we lift up the people in the areas of concern on our list that we have in front of us. We also want to uh, give you both the joys in our hearts and the pains in our hearts. We share those all with you. We particularly give thanks for the new baby that Cole Henderson has in their life now and bless that life as they move forward. The sun that has come out to be such a joy for all of us, it lifts the spirits and hopefully lifts the crops. At the first service, we were notified that Kathleen Hefner is in the hospital and we pray for wellness for her and that she, you can touch her life in the best ways that will heal her. The annual conference is going on, and we lift them up in prayers for best decision-making and good conversations. We do lift the immigrants that are at our borders and pray for them and that they will uh, have at least comfortable surroundings and will be able to get some services. We thank you for walking with us during all the times of our lives. Help us to remember to lift our hands to you in praise as well as in times of need. Help us to feel your presence as we celebrate the joyous times and feel your closeness as when, in times when we're alone or in need. Keep us mindful of you at all times and teach us to pray, to, or as you taught us to pray, we join together, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. God has blessed us in so many ways. We'd like to take just a few minutes to give back some of the blessings uh, through our offering. So we'll wait on our ushers for our morning offering. Children, I'm gonna do what the Spirit say do. do. Children, I'm gonna do what the Spirit say do. do. What happens when women organize for mission? Women have been in mission for centuries. 
In 1869, Methodist Episcopal church women learned that women in India could not be treated by male doctors, so they decided to do something about it. They raised funds to send a woman doctor, Clara Swain, and a woman teacher, Isabella Thoburn, to serve women and children in India. Their bold, courageous action galvanized the movement that's still turning faith, hope, and love into action today. United Methodist women serve in local churches and communities and speak up against injustice. Our second and third mile giving supports mission around the world. When women organize for mission, the needs of women, children, and youth are placed front and center. Over 100 years ago, daring, giving United Methodist women deaconesses set out to serve by founding schools for newly freed African Americans after the Civil War settlement houses for new immigrants, and mother's clubs in poor rural communities. Their work remains today as United Methodist Women support nearly 100 national mission institutions with services like childcare, parenting seminars, camps for children with special needs, and assistance to immigrants and survivors of human trafficking. When women organize their mission, their work extends around the world to more than 100 countries. And United Methodist Women regional missionaries engage in edgy, compassionate work in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Caribbean. Here at home, Mission U, a United Methodist Women transformative education program, promotes spiritual growth and Christian discipleship that is faithful, loving, and informed. Just as our four mothers knew long ago, women's lives matter. When women are educated and empowered, the lives of their children, families, and communities improve and their nation progresses because that's what happens when women organize for mission. And women still need to organize for mission because a quarter of a million women die worldwide from preventable causes related to pregnancy. Climate change and carbon emissions are responsible for five million deaths each year. The United States has the highest incarceration rate in the world and the top 10% of the U.S. population has twice the amount of wealth as the bottom 90%. And as United Methodist women continue to work on these critical issues, we also grow in our own most precious faith. We are a 150-year-old women's movement still saying yes to God's call to mission. Do what the Spirit says do. Please join with me in the prayer of dedication. Holy Spirit, bless the gifts we bring with your powerful presence. Through these gifts, bring new life, and new hope, new visions of life, new dreams of hope, and new possibilities for unity and love in our world. Amen. You can be seated. Today, we have heard just a small part of our early history. We know it began with just eight women who met and started the mission movement. So today, United Methodist Women is the largest denominational faith organization for women with approximately 800,000 members, whose mission is fostering spiritual growth, developing leaders, and advocating for justice. And just think, 
It all started with just eight women. So what are we doing in Iowa, and what are we doing in Grinnell? Well, in Iowa, we support three Iowa missions, Schessler Hall in Sioux City, and Hawthorne Hill and Bidwell Riverside in Des Moines. Schessler Hall assists homeless women with chronic mental illness to gain stability and life skills that help them to transition to permanent housing. Hawthorne Hill operates housing programs for homeless families with children. Their goal is to help them obtain permanent housing and to achieve economic self-sufficiency. Bidwell Riverside is constantly looking for ways to assist families to relieve the strain of poverty. They operate a food and clothing pantry open six days a week. The food pantry is part of the Des Moines Area Religious Council Network. This pantry provides a three-day supply of food based on family size once per calendar month. They also offer free clothing, toiletries, and children and adult diapers. Bidwell also operates a child development center for children 24 months to five years of age every weekday from 6.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. Locally, here in Grinnell, we are a very active group. Some of our activities include serving a community Lenten lunch sponsored by the Grinnell Ministerial Association. In April, we deliver flowers of faith. We arrange fresh flowers and deliver them to our nursing home residents and to congregation members who welcome a friendly visit and a cheery bouquet. In May, we serve a brunch for our graduating seniors. In June, we provide the worship service while our pastor is at annual conference. In November, we hold a soup luncheon fundraiser. The proceeds go towards the missions that United Methodist Women support. We have four circles, two, day, two daytime and two evening. And one of these circles knits hats, sweaters, and blankets for World Vision. We always welcome new members. Now we take the summer off, but our meetings start up again in the fall. And I'm sure we could find a circle to meet your schedule. Our closing hymn is Here I Am, Lord, page 593 in your hymnal. <laughs>
seated. I want to tell you how beautiful the singing was from up here. It's awesome. Um, for the benediction, I would like to close with this poem written by Louise Alley, who lived from 1923 to 2011. To me, United Methodist women means love. It means helping and caring. It also means friendship. It means giving and sharing. United Methodist women means faith to help each of us grow strong. It means a lot of guidance to fix whatever may go wrong. United Methodist women means honesty and a strong bond of trust. It means total fairness for, for, for whatever is right and just. United Methodist women means knowing God and taking the time to pray. It means providing programs that will help enlighten our day. United Methodist Women means supporting our community and helping with children's needs. It means helping the cause of women wherever their mission leads. United Methodist Women means friendship and fellowship. It means laughter and having fun. And then it also means eating because that's often what is done. United Methodist Women means ensuring diversity. It means inclusiveness to welcome each one. And when we have achieved all of this, it will mean a job well done. We want to thank you for coming today. And we would really like you to come to the uh, Friendship Center. There's a wonderful array of cupcakes. Come and help us to continue celebrating our birthday. Thank you. <laughs>